Welcome to First Look, Washington Post Live's one-stop shop for news and analysis. I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. An extraordinary day in American history yesterday, Donald Trump, a former president of the United States, surrendered to federal authorities after being indicted, his third criminal indictment for illegally trying to stay in power after losing the 2020 presidential election. Covering all aspects of this story for The Washington Post is Jackie Alamany, congressional investigations reporter for The Post. Jackie, welcome back to First Look. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. All right, so what specific laws is Trump accused of breaking? Very good question. It's a little confusing since there's now been, uh, you know, over 40 different counts that have that, that he's been accused of. But in this case, he has been accused of obstructing an official proceeding, attempting to obstruct an official proceeding, uh, conspiring against the people's civil right to have the vote counted and conspiring to defraud the United States. Um, many people that I spoke to over the course of, of the past few days since Jack Smith released this indictment have commended him for notably that last chart, that, that third charge that I mentioned, conspiring against people's civil rights to have their vote counted. This was a charge that the January 6th committee notably did not include in their charges. They had instead included an insurrection charge. Um, but a lot of the back and forth that we've already started hearing about this issue of free speech, which we can expect Trump's lawyers are going to put forward as his defense, that's kind of skirted with this, this charge because this actually avoids the issue of free speech and instead uh, you know, encourages jurists to, to judge former President Trump by his, his actual um, actions rather than his intent. Right, by, by his actions rather, rather than intent. So uh, as we know, Trump pleaded not guilty to all four of those counts against him. The first hearing in the case has already been set for August 28th, at which time a trial date will be set. Given Trump's penchant for delay, <laughs> what, what is the timetable for an actual trial? Oh, I, it's it's really hard to tell. We know that there is a sense of urgency here, and uh, both sides really have um, agreed at, at this point. Uh, well, actually, they haven't. The, the legal side of this argument has agreed that it's in the best interest of the American public and uh, just in, in general in accordance with the legal process of having these trials sooner rather than, than later. You saw even Eileen Cannon, who um, is, is overseeing the Mar-a-Lago documents case and is has made some sympathetic uh, decisions with regards to Trump in the past. Even she had said that some of the Trump asks to push these trials, particularly that documents case, to after the election. Um, were, did not did not make sense and, and was something that she didn't agree with. And instead, she set that trial for May. So I think that we could see a similar kind of timeline coming down. Um, but, you know, it's a different it's a, it is a different case um, and it's being tried in a very different place. As we all saw yesterday, the, the D.C. District Court overseeing this case is going to be Tanya Chutkin. Um, she's kept a, a pretty low profile, but she's actually delivered some of the, the harshest sentences to the insurrectionists who actually stormed uh, the Capitol on January 6th at the behest of Trump. Isn't uh, Judge Chutkin, let's talk about her for just a little bit. Isn't she the one who wrote in one of those cases, in her opinion, uh, that a, a, the pres a president is not a king? Am I remembering that correctly? The president is not a king and Trump is not president. Uh, it was a pretty epic and, and memorable line that will certainly go down in history. It's one that every single newsletter every day of this week has highlighted. And, and that was part of the decision that... Uh, was involved with the January 6th Congressional Committee that waived Trump's claims of executive privilege and uh, allowed the floodgate of materials that the January 6th Committee had requested from Trump's time in office regarding his efforts to overturn the results of the election, allowed the committee to finally get their hands on that. And it was really uh, an important turning point for committee staff um, who at that point were up against several different legal battles as they tried to get their investigation off the ground. So the magistrate judge uh, yesterday advised Trump not to communicate with anyone uh, known to be a witness in the case unless it's through an attorney. What was the reason behind that? 
the the reason behind that in general is just there is an obvious um, legal and and ethical issue there as um, you know Trump ha in particular has been known um, to inappropriately communicate with a lot of these people who were privy to some of these actions that he's now being criminally charged for. So I think that there's this um, idea that they don't want any witness tampering. They, they don't want him to apply any pressure. They don't want him to um, put any undue influence on any of these people. But that's also going to be a, a really tall order as many of these people actually still work for him, work closely with him, or work in some capacity connected to his 2024 re-election campaign. That's why this was actually such a point of contention in the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Um, you know, we saw some back and forth between Todd Blanche, the person helming Trump's legal operation, uh, and um, prosecutors down in, in Miami a few weeks ago about this, who said that, you know, it, that Trump should not be able to, to talk to any of these people. And uh, Trump Trump's lawyers argued, well, these are people who help make Trump's life run. They they assist him in his day to day. And it's it's impossible for him not to communicate with some of them. The January 6th case is a little bit different because um, some of these people are, are a little bit more removed than his co-conspirator, for example, Walt Nada, who we all saw yesterday actually assisting the former president in making his way to and from the courthouse. Um, but they're, they're, the same issues still apply. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about one uh, one of the more curious things uh, from the 45-page indictment of Donald Trump, and that is the six co-conspirators who were not named but described. Why weren't they named? Yeah, described in detail. Um, in detail. They, they, <laughs> yeah, well, we know those five, we know at least five of the six to be uh, Jeffrey Clark, John Eastman, Sidney Powell, Rudy Giuliani uh, and and Ken Cheesebro uh, was I believe the fourth or the fifth, but um, they were the named. One. But that is that is something that we are all sort of speculating about, but we don't have any concrete answers about why exactly they weren't named. Um, it's pretty standard if someone is not being charged with an actual crime, if they are not a co-defendant, co-conspirator, that they will not be named in the public documents or in, in this case, the speaking indictment, um, so as to sort of not publicly incriminate them as they're not being charged with anything. But there is this sense here that a potential future target letters or indictments might be inevitable with some of these people. We also are not sure whether or not these people are cooperating or not, um, which, which you know, could uh, also be the major determinant of whether or not we see any future charges land against uh, th this group of people. Uh, one more question for you before I let you go. Enjoy your Friday, Jackie. Um, there's a lot of talk now about televising this trial, a federal trial, where there are no cameras allowed in the courtroom. How likely is it that this trial will be televised or maybe at a minimum the audio made available to the American people for such an important trial? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure of the percentage of the likelihood, but I do think that there is an obvious case here um, of why allowing at least audio or some sort of access to this trial in real time would be a benefit to the American public writ large. And uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that there's going to be a number of parties that are going to make that case and petition for that sort of access. As we saw with the January 6th Congressional Committee, um, which really saw their role as complementary to the Justice Department and as part of the education role in providing the American public with an actual visual and audio narrative as to the events that happened in the lead up to January 6th, Trump's role in it and what actually happened on January 6th. I think that people view this case similarly. Um, there's this idea that if a lot of this plays out behind closed doors, it allows Trump to kind of manipulate the narrative, maybe um, misrepresent a lot of what is happening. Uh, and 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 um, you know, in this era of of disinformation and people living in their own media silos, um, I think that there there really isn't a more important case than, than transparency here, so that people can see with their own eyes Trump 
um, Trump allies, confidants, and former staffers, in their own words, providing evidence that incriminate, as we saw in this indictment, uh, the former president. Jackie Alamany, congressional investigations reporter for The Washington Post, as always. Thank you for coming to First Look. Have a good weekend. You too. I'm going to keep the conversation going with our opinions roundtable in just a moment. Let's go to the opinion side of the Washington Post, where we will find Washington Post associate editor and columnist Eugene, Bo <laughs> Eugene Robinson, who's there on the bottom <laughs> of your screen, and Washington Post columnist <laughs> Megan McArdle. <laughs> Gene, Megan, welcome back to First Look. Well, fine. Let me, let me assure everybody, we, we all do know each other, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So I, I want to play two... <laughs> I want to play two clips back to back. The first one is from uh, from Donald Trump uh, in Washington. I, I, I can't remember if it's, uh, I think it was after uh, his arraignment. And then Mike Pence from, I think, a couple days ago. The, uh, Donald Trump first. Watch this. Uh, when you look at what's happening, this is a persecution of a political opponent. This was never supposed to happen in America. This is the persecution of the person that's leading by very, very substantial numbers in the Republican primary and leading Biden by a lot. So if you can't beat him, you persecute him or you prosecute him. We can't let this happen in America. Thank you very much. The president uh, specifically asked me and his gaggle of, uh, of crackpot lawyers asked me to literally reject votes, to, which would have resulted in, uh, in the issue being turned over to the House of Representatives, and literally chaos would have ensued. I would love both of your reactions to, to both of those comments. I mean, it's you, you know, two completely different perspectives of, of, of what happened. Uh, Megan, you go first. Look, I think that... Uh... That's the the story of the country, right? No, we, everyone is seeing the same events and interpreting them different differently. And that is what I fear about this indictment is that we're not going to be able to get a consensus on what happened on January 6th, that this indeed, because of the kind of unique characteristics of this trial, that it will leave us more divided than ever. Wait, Jean, is it a matter of interp of interpretation? Well, what happened on January 6th did happen, um, and, and I actually think that this is what we have uh, the judicial system for, and it's, you know, trials um, uh, are supposed to unearth the facts and the truth, and the jury ultimately is the, is the finder of fact, the fact of what happened. And so, um, so, uh, so... Will it leave us more divided than ever? Well, how do you get more divided than this? You know, I mean, we're, we're um, I, I worry less about that than I would worry uh, if we were, if, if there were not charges in this case, and if we were not going to go through a, a, a process. And, you know, it would be great if it could be televised and the whole nation could see it. I really seriously doubt that's going to happen. But, you know, they asked the one person who could make that happen, and that's Chief Justice John Roberts. Mm -hmm. um, I, to be clear, I, I, go ahead, I, I, to be clear, I'm not ambiguous about what Donald Trump did. He is morally responsible <laughs> for inciting mm -hmm. that was perilously close to treason. My concern is, did he commit a did he commit a crime that is within the legal bounds of this statute? And I think that that's a harder question. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this is obviously being conducted by his opponent's administration, it is going to be tried in a city that went 92 percent for Joe Biden in 2020, where even in the 2016 Republican caucus, he Trump got 13 percent of the vote. This is probably the unfriendliest jury pool you can literally find in the country. And the appearance of that is going to be a problem for the legitimacy of the trial, even if you righteously think that, that Donald Trump clearly violated the law. And to be clear, the, the trial is being tried in a city where the alleged crime was committed, which is, Absolutely. you know. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's not an unfortunate yeah, I, coincidence, but. It doesn't help the optics, regardless of the right. legitimacy. I, I understand why it's being tried here, but 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I get what you're saying. Just sure. doing the clarification for the audience. Before we get into the, the, the politics of all of this, we'd love each of you to say, should this trial be televised? Megan, you go first. Um, I think it should be um, for the same reasons that, that Jean put. So it, it, being able to see it, and Jackie, the, the, to being able to see it, if we have any shot at making this a legitimate proceeding to the half of the country that voted for Donald Trump, it yeah. needs to be, yeah. Caesar's wife needs to be above reproach and needs to be seen to be above reproach. And that means what I wanna see is a very clean trial in which the defense is given every benefit of the doubt, gets the rulings it deserves in its favor, and then proceeds, you know, and, and people see that. Um, is that going to happen? I, I don't know, but I think it should. Gene? Gene. I completely agree with Megan. It should be televised. Uh, this is uh, it, a unique situation. And I think, uh, you know, the federal courts uh, have, have been incredibly conservative um, uh, and, re and reluctant, frankly, adamant uh, uh, against cameras in the courtroom. And uh, that was I, it, perhaps understandable uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, at, at this point, I think um, that horse has been out of the barn for a long time, yet the federal courts have not kept pace. I just, um, so I hope that the chief justice, who really is the only person who could who can make an exception in this case, and 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 make it happen. Uh, I hope he's reading, <clears throat> you know, the op-eds like the one we had this morning from Neil Cacciao and and others that are being written elsewhere. Uh, and I hope he's he's watching first look. And I hope he he takes this to heart uh, and seriously considers uh, allowing this trial to be televised. I, I'm somewhat, you know, I'm, I'm not that optimistic that he will, but I hope he he will because it would be important. All right, I, you, you, I think you caught me looking. Go ahead, Megan, sorry. I think there are legitimate reasons to worry about having cameras in courtrooms in general. Um, the legal process is biased towards defendants. I think that's great. I, it's one of my favorite things about the American justice system. Yes. Um, and w because it's sort of the procedures for doing that are sort of weird, you can end up with a situation where it might unfairly bias the public against the defendant. If they were watching the trial, it can turn into a circus. But I think in this case, he performed his 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 alleged crimes, um, definitely moral crimes for the cameras. And I think he should be able to face justice uh, under the same conditions. Okay. Uh, earlier, um, y'all caught me looking down because I'm, I'm catching up on this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, new poll um, that is in, in the New York Times actually showing that Trump is leading DeSantis um, but double support in uh, among Iowa Republican voters, 44% to DeSantis, 20%. Nationally, um, Trump is leading among Republican voters, 54% to DeSantis's 17%. And I bring this up because, Gene, the day before the indictment was announced, you said in an online chat, and I want to quote, I don't see why even convictions would loosen the ties between former President Trump and the MAGA GOP base. Why do you think those ties are so strong? Oh, gee, Jonathan, you know, how many books have been written <laughs> trying to answer that question? Uh, and, and a lot more will be written. Uh, and so we can go into all the, um, you know, socioeconomic theories and, um, and demographic theories and, and you know, identity theories about um, why that bond is there, uh, but it's there, uh, and and it's and it's clearly uh, extremely strong. And so this, you know, if if, if anything, this will probably further uh, this indictment uh, will probably further cement um, that feeling of of I don't know if it's kinship. I don't know if you call it. Um, uh, I don't know what you call it, but it's it's there and it's not going away. Uh, Megan, uh, you know, 
in that clip that I showed of, of uh, former Vice President Mike Pence, he goes on to say that Trump put himself put himself over the Constitution, and that should disqualify disqualify him for uh, from ever being president again. Does that statement alone end Pence's political career in the current political party? Um. <laughs> Did I think Pence had a political career <laughs> left I know, I before that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, no. Uh, look, I think yes. I think it's unfortunate that that unfortunate. It's not even a strong enough word, but I, you know, profanity is too weak. Um, that <laughs> the Republican Party at this point I see as divided by into about twenty five percent of people will just never vote for him. They view January sixth as utterly dis qualifying and that's it. They didn't like him before, now they're done. Um, that's the most liberal, and I mean that in the classically liberal um, section of the party. Then you've got about a third who are just hardcore MAGA. And I think those are the people, you can't separate those people from Donald Trump. It doesn't matter. He could literally shoot someone on Fifth Avenue. And if I want to make a defense of this, defense is maybe not the right word. Um, I'm really struggling here for words today. But if I, if I want to try to explain how they see it, it's that they see not entirely unfairly that like, look, first of all, there's always a lot of who whom in politics. You saw this with Richard Nixon, still had 25% of Republicans on his side right before he resigned. Um, you saw this with Bill Clinton, where the Democratic Party suddenly did a radical about face on what men in power should do with their junior female staffers um, as soon as Bill Clinton was in the dock. So there's always some of that in politics, and that's part of it. Another part of it is that they see that like the institutions are controlled by people like us, that the rules, that we understand how to navigate the rules better and that the rules are kind of written to benefit us in the same way that great Anatole France quote about how the law and its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges and beg for bed bread. Um, those people are just not reachable, and I think they will go to their graves believing that Trump was robbed. But I think there's also a third of the party that understands something bad happened on January 6th, doesn't see it as disqualifying, and I have deep disagreements with them about that, but they're also reachable on, no, he actually committed a crime. Uh, also, I think on the documents cases, on other cases. And here, that group of people, because I think it is important that all of this resolve with legitimacy restored to the government, I don't think the MAGA heads are reachable. I think that those people, and that that is going to be a problem for the Republican Party because you know, how do you how do you navigate that? Right. You have to go against Trump and you can't go against Trump um, because and they're so personally okay. loyal to one man. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Gene, this gets to um, something that was reported in, in in The New York Times. I'm sorry, not The New York Times. Wow. <laughs> Megan's having a hard time looking for words <laughs> and I'm having a hard time keeping <laughs> media outlets <laughs> straight. But it's the, New, the Washington Post reported this week that former President Barack Obama at lunch in June with President Biden warned him that Trump will be a more formidable opponent than many Democrats realize. And, and here's the key line that jumped out at me in the story, quote, during their lunch, Obama made it clear his concerns were not about Biden's political abilities, but rather a recognition of Trump's iron grip on the Republican Party, according to the people who were the sources for this Post story. What do you make of this? And what do you make of this story coming out now? Well, look, I think the important thing that came out of that story is that Obama has uh, promised to get in, involved in campaigning and presumably fundraising um, for uh, the Biden ticket uh, as the Biden-Harris ticket early this time. He likes to be the closer Usually in his post-presidency elections, he comes in at the end. That's how he, see, he has seen his role. Um, this time he's getting in early, and I think that's a good thing um, uh, for the, for the um, Biden-Harris ticket and, and the Democrats. Um, I, I, when, I, when I read the story, I wondered what exactly it is that he thinks um, President Biden doesn't understand about Trump uh, about and about Trump's uh, um, hold on that that chunk of the Republican Party that Megan was talking about and about um, his you know formidability uh, as as a candidate. 
Uh, I think President Biden probably understands that as well as anybody. If he doesn't, then it's a good thing, you know, President Obama reminded him. Um, but I think the more important thing is that he's going to be in, involved, and presumably Michelle Obama will be involved early too. And these are basically the two uh, most popular Democrats. Period. Right. Right. And <clears throat> excuse me, and Megan, you're, what did you think? So I think I disagree with President Obama. My basic thesis is that the only way Trump wins the election in 2024 at this point is either if we're in a deep recession, which is possible, or if President Biden is forced to step aside in favor of Kamala Harris, who I just consider to be a much weaker candidate. Um, and I, you know, neither of those things is really related to Donald Trump. You can't do anything about them. They will happen or they don't. Um, but I think that Barack Obama is like your mom, right? Your mom knows that you know that you should wear your seatbelt, but she's your mom <laughs> and she's worried. And in this case, mom went through a pretty bad traffic accident, right? Where we all assumed that no one could possibly vote for Donald Trump. And then it turned out, oh my gosh, he could he won the election. And so I think you have to see this in terms of like, I mean, despite the fact that Obama is younger yeah. than Biden, you have to yeah. see this as a combination of trauma yeah. and just wanting to make sure that, like, my little darling goes out there and, like, has their best life. I think that's I think that's right. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I don't even... I think I wait. I think we're done. I think we are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I lost all track of my time cues. But Eugene Robinson, Megan McCardle, uh, thank you as always for coming to First Look. <laughs> oh, have so. a good have weekend. Good. Was, have a good weekend. It was hard getting to Friday this week, so have have a good weekend. <laughs> you too, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Head to WashingtonPostLive.com to find more information about next week's interviews and to register. I'm Jonathan Capehart. Thank you for watching Washington Post Live's First Look.